he goes from C sharp minor through those descending chromatic scales to D flat major, which is, and harmonically, it's the same note, and that's that equality of major and minor that the Romantics now are obsessed with. It's a new kind of, you know, somewhat tonal ambiguity that becomes a new passion. And, matter of fact, this passion for 12 major and 12 minor keys continues, maybe this jump from Johann Sebastian Bach to Chopin, but we're in the Romantic era. Fugues are out of fashion, so instead of 24 preludes and fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach, we just get 24 preludes to nothing from Chopin. And they tend to be vignettes, very short, another aspect of the Romantic era. Either it's very long or it's very short. And once again, unlike Johann Sebastian Bach, who does a prelude and fugue in C major, then in A, no, then C minor, then in C sharp major, then in C sharp minor. With Chopin, he goes around the circle of fifths, which by now we're starting to uh, come to terms with. So he starts in C major, and the second prelude is in A minor, same key signature, a minor third down. Then he goes to G major, a perfect fifth up from C major, then a minor third down, same key signature, one sharp to E minor, and this is the one we're going to hear. By this point, Chopin is paired with an individual named George Sand. Not what you think. This is a female writer who has taken on a male persona, complete by being basically kind of a transvestite, dressing like a male, smoking big stogie cigars, and indeed a portrait of her and also uh, Chopin by the uh, romantic uh, painter Degas shows them in this kind of stern, angst-ridden way. The preludes and fugues, or sorry, the preludes were at least some written in the extreme south of France. That would be the island of Corsica during one of those Mediterranean rainy winters. And you can hear it's a dripping of the soul in, in rainy despair, descending chromaticism, and very intuitive, radical harmony using lots of seventh chords. And it's almost like he's experimenting by saying, what happens if I just drop one finger down in this chord? And why don't I drop another? What will that sound like? And meanwhile, a very lonely melody up top in the uh, other hand which I've gotten backwards because I'm looking at myself this way. Here it is, the prelude in E minor. Ah, the darkness of the soul. But did you notice that traditional 5-1 ending, just a plain old authentic cadence? Still a lot of tradition around, too. And that's also true of another one of our more conservative composers, Robert Schumann, who's also closely allied, at least in spirit, with uh, Franz Schubert. As a matter of fact, at one point in Germany, they issued commemorative stamps of Schubert and Schumann, and they got their names reversed with the pictures. So that's the way it goes. Here is an excerpt from Schumann's Symphony No. 4, just the beginning of the, uh, after an introduction, uh, the beginning of the Sonata Allegro first subject. Oh, and if you don't write nine symphonies, you write four as in Schumann and Brahms, or maybe five in the case of Mendelssohn. Symphony number four, though, from Schumann right now. <laughs> Sometimes the conservatives become radical, and the radicals conservative. In the second category, you can think of Liszt, who started with crazy stuff like Danse Macabre, channeling the old medieval Dies Irae, which of course Berlioz used as well, and does progressive music most of his life, very advanced harmonic uh, keyboard writing and orchestral, and then takes minor orders as a cleric at the end of his life. Go figure. And then Verdi 
who we've seen as more on the conservative side as a composer, radical subjects, not only with Rigoletto, as we heard last week, with uh, the aristocracy being the bums, but Il Trovatore, the troubadour, channeling medieval music, a story of fratricide, followed, we're going to hear three excerpts in a row, followed by La Traviata, uh, the frail one, and this would be a uh, boy meets girl situation where a girl is much older. I can identify with this, by the way. Uh, she's an aging uh, prostitute, high class courtesan. In uh, I very could identify as well because he was partnered with an older woman himself, uh, a famous soprano who had maybe by that point seen better days, but was a wonderful woman nonetheless. And finally, a story of interracial love, Aida, set in Egypt celebrating actually the opening of the Suez Canal in terms of its premiere. And in this case, boy meets, Prince Boy meets Slave Girl. And in the scene that we're going to hear, uh, the triumphal entry from Aida, unbeknownst to Boy, Girl's father has just been captured. And what's it going to be? Uh, love for lover or love for father? Uh, and this... Uh, scene has been used in many graduations over the years, by the way, not so much in the present day. The excerpt from uh, La Traviata will be a drinking song, so we'll be channeling uh, a little Josquin de Pre El Grillo a couple of centuries later and opening with the famous Anvil Chorus from uh, Il Trovatore, which, by the way, has a mi, 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 re, do, la, so uh, motive, and it's exactly the same as another 19th century piece uh, in uh, the Protestant tradition, a guy named William Bradbury. Jesus loves the little children. Go figure. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 